Good afternoon, everyone. Is anyone there? Good afternoon. Fantastic to see you all. Uh, technology will turn our children into robots. I hear that quite a bit. I think the education system has turned our children into robots. We do really well on the PISA score system as an education system in England, really, really well. In fact, it's make us, made us the envy of a lot of other education systems around the world. Do you know what we're good at? Why, why we we're nearly at the top of that list? It's for regurgitation of information. We are essentially training our students to be advanced level robots in an age of advanced level robots. My name's Dan Fitzpatrick. Um, I was a teacher uh, locally in County Durham in a secondary school. I worked on the senior leadership team there and brought about some digital transformation and then moved into the FE sector, uh, working locally for some local colleges as their director of digital strategy. And I was privileged to be asked earlier this year to write a book to introduce teachers into what artificial intelligence is, how it will impact education, and frameworks for them to start using it. You'll have heard of this quote. I always use it at the start of talks like this, and have done for about four years, because I think it delivers a bit of an impact. McKinsey and Company, they said that we will experience more technological change than we did in the preceding 100 years. That's a bold statement. A really bold statement. What technological advances have we had over the last 100 years? Shout them out at me. Go on. The internet. Anyone else? Transportation. Transportation. Anything else? Transportation. One at a time, please. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Keep coming. Quantum, Quantum computing. Flushing toilets. Wait a minute. <laughs> <laughs> Sometimes people go for putting humans on the moon. <laughs> Flushing toilets. I was in Swansea yesterday doing, this, doing a similar talk and somebody said, microwave. It's like, wait till you hear about the air fryer. It, it will <laughs> knock your socks off. <laughs> all of that, the flushing toilet and all, and more in the next, let's say six years. This is a four-year-old quote. Six years. I don't think, even though I was presenting this slide, I don't think I fully understood it until the first time I played around with generative AI in the form of ChatGPT. Hands up if you've used ChatGPT before. Amazing. Hands up if you've never heard of ChatGPT before. Thanks for being honest. No, thank you. Um, I, I, I've been, I do this talk to educators all around the country and, and, and the world, and, and the amount of hands that go up is quite scary. Uh, I, if you've had a go of this, you will see the potential in this technology for us. Now, this is the three-box model for innovation. Okay? Um, it says that whatever your organisation is, whatever you do, and I apply this a lot to the education system, think of it in three different boxes. The first box is, box is the optimising the current system. Okay, it's what we're already doing. What we're doing on a daily basis is the systems in our, our workplace, wherever we, we work, whatever business we work for, whatever educational organisation we work for. It's what we do to, that gets us success. It's the performance engine. We can do things to really optimise it. We can make people's lives a bit better by reducing their workload. God knows the education system needs that at the moment. We can do loads of things. But the best we're ever going to get or the limits of that system. This model says that successful companies need to spend some time in box three. Box three is where we go to to listen for weak signals. What do I mean by that? What's coming in a few years' time that could disrupt our box one? What's coming in 10 years' time that could disrupt our box one? Maybe if we were doing this event five years ago, and maybe you did, you, you would have discussed generative AI 
because all the, the telltale signs were there. OpenAI were writing papers on it with their intention of what they wanted to do. Google were writing papers on it. Maybe we would have said generative AI is going to be a huge thing. How do we start preparing for it? Good leaders hold box one and box three in balance. Box two, by the way, is what do you get rid of from box one? The values, the systems, the processes that will help us move to box three. Probably the hardest box there. I think, based on my experience, that the education system has never done box three. While all the world around has been under transformation, look at the transformation we've had through technology over the last few decades. The education system has had a knack of sidestepping any non-linear innovation. I, it was my job. We would put smart screens in classrooms and call it innovation. <laughs> Crazy. You laugh at that, but I, I'd say that to teachers and they'd be like, what, isn't, that is innovation, isn't it? Essentially just replacing the blackboard with a screen. The, tech, the, ed, the education system's got a great knack of going, we'll have that bit of advancement, we'll have that bit of technology, as long as it supports what we're already doing. Anyone recognise this image? <laughs> Hands up if you've seen it before. Some newspapers ran with this uh, as a humorous piece saying, look what the Pope's wearing. Completely generated by artificial intelligence. <laughs> Completely. By a tool called Midjourney. Anyone seen these images before? <laughs> a few months ago, when the rumours went around that Trump was going to be arrested, these images appeared online. As much as we might want them to be true, in fact, they were generated by artificial intelligence. We're living in a new world. A completely new world. A song had to be pulled down off... Snapped, uh, off... Spotify a few weeks ago, because it was completely generated with artificial intelligence. Lyrics made with ChatGPT, the voices of Drake and The Weeknd. I've never, I don't really know who they are, but apparently the, <laughs> the voices of Drake and The Weeknd were used. And, and, a, and a new song was created. Apparently it was really good as well. Um, I think we're living in an era where we will create new worlds simply using words. <laughs> Natural language systems mean that we can now do more creatively, I mean, people like me who don't have a creative bone in their body, than we ever have. We're looking at a world where creativity is democratised. By the way, I'm not going to get onto it in this talk, but I think there's hope there for those who have the technical skills. A lot of hope. I think that's a, a whole talk on its own. But the, the floor's been raised. A lot of the, well, in fact, I think every image in this presentation is made with mid-journey. Before, I would have had to get some, got some stock images, and it would have been a bit bland, because I can't create my own images. Now I can. In February, Osaka University in Japan released an academic paper where they trained an AI model to understand MRI scans. What they did was they got some participants to look at lots of stock photos. And they, measured, they put the MRI scans into the AI machine. Because they got them to look at tens and tens of thousands, the AI machine began to learn what an MRI scan would look like based on the, the shapes, the, the colours within the, the photo. To the point where they then asked the participants to think of an image in their head, a bit like a magician would do. The images in red are the images that they thought of. They then took the MRI scan, fed it into the AI machine, and it produced the images below. Essentially read their minds. We're still in the very early days of this technology. Where are we going to be next year? Are we spending time in box three to know where, what kind of world our children are going to be living in? Uh, I want to give you an example of something that we did. We, I worked with a history teacher, and we decided to take ChatGPT. We asked it to be Henry VIII, as you do. And we said, right, speak like Henry VIII. We got an, uh, an audio, AI audio website to create the, the voice. We used Midjourney to create an image. And then we used a separate tool 
to merge them together. This took 10 minutes, no technical skills. The only skills needed were to being able to log in to four different websites, copy and paste, upload and download. And this is what it came out with. Wolsey, that Cardinal of York, was a trusted advisor and servant to me for many years. He served as Lord Chancellor and was instrumental in the administration of my kingdom. However, his failure to secure the annulment of my marriage to Catherine of Aragon was the beginning of his downfall. A lot of people ask if that image was based on me. It's not at all. <laughs> It, does, it looks nothing like me. What are you laughing at? Uh, <laughs> two and a half months later, I went back to the same tools, used the same prompts, and this is what it came out with two and a half months later. Wolsey's primary duty was to serve me, his king, and yet he did not accomplish what I demanded of him. As thou mayest know, I did seek to annul mine marriage to Catherine of Aragon, for she did not bear me a male heir to secure the Tudor dynasty. I sought the Pope's permission. Not only are we living in a different world, we're living in a vastly changing world, where this technology is going to get even better and better. This is, we used uh, an image a bit like Midjourney, but you type in what you want to see, and it creates a full 360 immersive environment. Worked with primary school children on this. They created their own immersive worlds in seconds. This was based on To Kill a Mockingbird, the book. This is somebody with a VR headset on looking around this. This was created in 30 minutes. My old job, I used to work um, in vi virtual reality. And within, within a college, we, we invested a lot of money in virtual reality. And we were commissioning similar works like this for about £15,000 a pop. 30 minutes, no technical skills now, one year later. Greg Brockman, the co-founder of OpenAI, said a year from today, the technology we're using is going to be quaint and antiquated. We need a strategy. For me, strategy is about leadership in the future. How are we going to lead tomorrow? How are we going to lead in five years, ten years? And in a world where the only constant has changed, like I've demonstrated, then the education system needs to adapt, and it needs to adapt fast. This is where I deliver some bad news. Based on my experience, I don't think we're going to move fast enough. You might wonder, though, is that really bad news? Is there an alternative? I think there is going to be an alternative that reaches us. The education system is not going to be able to keep up with this. It's too tied down on politics. It's too tied down on this is what worked yesterday, so it will work tomorrow. There are schools now appearing around the world that will give your children a phenomenal education. They're coming from online schools. They're coming from schools from America. This is a school come out of California. It's called Synthesis, where they meet with children around the world a few times per week, and they teach them specifically problem-solving skills and collaboration skills. And the children doing this, eight, nine, ten years old, have already got interest from industry because they know that they're going to have some really, really valuable skills when they're a bit older. This is the school. So this is, is like the next level of education. You're learning by playing a game. And it's not like your ordinary school where you just sit in a classroom and someone tells you what to do. The first time I joined, I was like, what is this? They just threw me in there and said, good luck, we got the rules. I didn't expect that at all. And then I just realized it was a game. Wow, this is so cool. I so want to do this. They're always making the game different. So I need to be a Synthesis have just released their, their AI math tutor, which is already having a massive impact. You can go on and try this. You can demo it on their website. I was trying it the other day. I learned binary numbers. I was like, nobody ever taught me this in school. And the, the lesson was pitched at an, an eight-year-old. <laughs> but I got so much from it. Um, this is a, a case study from my book. And it's a guy called Phil in Manchester. Back in, I think it was January time, his daughter was doing her SATs and she was really struggling with maths, really struggling with it. And he decided to program ChatGPT to be her math tutor. So he, he typed into it, even gave it a name, Izzy. He said, uh, teach my daughter maths, uh, talk to her in this way, in this tone. If she asks this type of question, do this type of response. He spent a lot of time on it and iterated it. 
She's just won a national award in maths. No school was involved in this process. No college was involved, just a parent and their child. Non-traditional disruption has come into education. I think we're going to get a decentralised education journey. I've got a two and a three-year-old. I can't wait to be able to choose what they're going to do. They're going to do synthesis. They're going to spend time at sports clubs in the afternoon. They're going to, they're going to spend time with their friends. We have to, I think we, we're living in a time now where we can't just farm out our children's education and, and think that the education system knows what it's doing. I'm speaking from someone who was in the education system. We all have to ask this question, why are we sending our kids off to school? And is there an alternative? I'm going to end with this. Uh, back in 1997, Gary Kasparov was beaten by Deep Blue. And he famously said, chess is over. Is chess over? A lot of chess fans in the room today. <laughs> chess has never been, you wouldn't think it, chess has never been more popular than it, than it is today. 30-second um, chess it's, uh, is a big thing, apparently. Uh, children play it all over the world now. It's really, really popular. Why? When the most technical thing to do would be to watch two AI machines play, play it. The best thing to do if you want to watch an amazing game of chess would be to watch two AIs play it. We still choose the human. We still choose the human interaction, because human interaction is what makes us human. I think with this technology, there's an, an amazing opportunity for AI to help us, to help our children be more human, to do the things that turn us into robots. And unfortunately, at the minute, that is our education system. The nature of the dance between humans and machines, I think it perfectly sums up where we are today. Said by David Price, OBE, when I was interviewing him for my book, I think it's really profound. What's the next step? I think it has to be intentional from us. Somebody has to lead the dance. I've watched too much Strictly Come Dancing to know that, okay? <laughs> Somebody has to lead. I hope it's us. I hope we do it with intent. And I hope we can have that hopeful future with artificial intelligence. Thank you very much. First of all, thank you so much for that. Uh, fascinating uh, topic, and, and certainly I think we can all see the A, education. Uh, we've had Sugata Mitra, who I know you're uh, friends with, uh, a couple of times uh, at Thinking Digital, and is obviously one of, one of his, his big things is that we are effectively using a system designed in the Victoria era, really effectively as a babysitting service so that parents could go to, could, to, go to, to their jobs. And, so what I wanted to know more specifically is how long do you, and I know it's really, you know, predicting the future is obviously a, a fool's game, if you will, but since I am a fool, uh, rough, rough, I mean, you know, like, how many years are we thinking before you start to see, like, oh, this is happening, right? Uh, that, that change, and I realize it, so just any, any sense as to, you know, how quickly this might start to change things in a big way. I think, there has to, I think there's going to be a tipping point. I think the tipping point has to be when a lot of parents discover there's an alternative. Okay. I think we, and the way it's worked at the moment is actually parents are in a, are in a place where they think, well, it worked for me. It's what I did. Sure. And actually parents who it didn't work for, of which there's a lot of them, sure. think it didn't work for me because it was my fault. Yeah. And they aspire to have their kids exactly. get higher on the rung. And you see, when you're doing parents' evenings as a teacher, they come in and they're really nervous. Yeah, they, of course. Because they had a, such a bad time at school. Yeah. But they still put school on a pedestal. Yeah. Um, I think we, we're going to need... It was interesting, I was talking to Gerd Leonard, the, the futurist, and he was saying that he thinks the next Google, the next big, massive company to take over the world is going to be uh, a private education provider. Okay. And I think it's going to take from that route, but then also the awareness okay. of the parents. So in, in, in this private education future, at least, I'm not saying that's the only option, but a, an option. I mean, I guess what I'm also wondering is the headlines that we read in five, 10, whatever the number of years ahead that, that this phenomenon starts to take hold. I mean, what, what, is it ultimately basically someone's gonna offer an AI field education service, I assume primarily online, and it will be able to prove results that are just undeniable and people would just start pulling the kids out of school and just say, screw this, I'll, I'll pay for 
pay for it's already happening so right. a lot of the a lot of the the big tech developers in silicon valley are taking their kids out of mainstream school to put them onto courses like synthesis because they recognize that the skills they're being taught there aren't being taught in mm. mainstream education um i i think I think there's a, there's, there'll be issues, massive issues. I think equity will be a huge issue. Sure. Because what happens when you can't afford to... They'll be affordable, but what happens when you can't afford to put your school yeah. on, onto an online school? We're going we're gonna to see some disruption, but it's not all going to be positive. But I think, to answer your question, I think what, we're gonna, what we will see is options. We'll see a menu. Okay. Parents, will have, parents will have options to be able to go, you know what, um, my... My daughter can can go to synthesis on a Monday morning, yeah. and on an afternoon she 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 goes to tennis club. Because right. um, a lot of people, when you when you present this, a lot of people go, "Well, okay. we're going to tie but students to computers all day." Or, yeah. Not at all. Sure. We need to have that balance, and I think taking over control of that is is the key. So actually, independent schools might actually be the first victims. If you're saying is that basically the money the money class are the mm. ones who are saying, "Screw this." Eaton stuff, <laughs> no offense to Eaton or any graduates for that, but that, you know, those are the ones you're saying are with the means, well, and I guess... There's a reason why Eaton have just created Eaton X, an okay. online version of their school, because they see this coming as well. Right, okay, interesting. Uh, a lot to discuss. Thank you so much for coming and, and provoking our imaginations about the future of education. Thanks, Herb. Cheers, man. Thank you.